Well, welcome. Thank you for joining us um, at Jack. We are so excited to be joined today by Dr. Richard Prattley, who is the first author of the recently published um, sub-study of the flow trial in Jack. And um, Rich, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Nia. It's great to be here. Uh, so just by way of introduction, uh, I'm a uh, diabetologist, a clinical investigator, uh, focusing mainly in the diabetes space. I work at Advent Health in uh, Orlando, Florida, but I worked in clinical trials uh, in the diabetes and cardiovascular space for uh, some time. Absolutely. You are you are an established trialist. There's no question about it. And also as way of introduction for folks that don't know me, I'm Neha Pagadipati and I'm a preventive cardiologist at Duke University. And I was the associate editor that handled this paper and that has handled many of the um, GLP-1 related papers. So um, Rich, first, what I'd love to hear from you a little bit about just to level set and make sure that people are all on the same page. This was a sub analysis um, that you published looking at heart failure outcomes in the flow trial. But could we start with just um, kind of a recap of what the the original flow trial showed? Sure. So the flow trial was a study of the effects of semaglutide once weekly, uh, one milligram, on outcomes in patients with type two diabetes and chronic kidney disease. So we had very specific definitions for chronic kidney disease and the vast majority of patients enrolled were at high risk. Most of the patients were on uh, ACE inhibitors or ARBs uh, and about 3,500 patients uh, were randomized one to one. We followed them for an average of about 3.4 years. What flow showed, the primary outcome, is that there was a 27% reduction in this composite kidney outcome. That composite included uh, kidney failure, a decline of uh, EGFR of 50%, uh, and also, also cardiovascular death. But the uh, benefits were seen when we just looked at the kidney outcomes. There was also a decrease in EGFR that was uh, significant, a decrease in the decline in EGFR uh, that was significant. Uh, and there was a decrease in MACE events by 18% and an overall mortality. So flow really hit on all of its primary as well as secondary outcomes. And it demonstrated this real remarkable consistency of benefit in this very high risk population. Absolutely. And it's and it was incredibly exciting uh, to read as well, because, you know, we know about the cardiovascular benefits or we know of some of the cardiovascular benefits of this agent. But it was not clear until the flow trial that there were also kidney benefits um, in this population. And, you know, when we as cardiologists look at the flow trial, we can say it's just a kidney trial, but it's not. This is a very um, high risk population for cardiovascular events and for heart failure. Right. We know that people with kidney disease and type 2 diabetes are at incredibly high risk for developing heart failure. And when they do develop heart failure, they have even worse outcomes than people who don't have kidney disease or who don't have type 2 diabetes. So I think that this um, secondary analysis that you've just done is incredibly important looking at the impact of semaglutide one milligram once weekly on heart failure events in this population. So um, could you recap for us what the highlights of the study show? Sure. Well, as you mentioned, this wasn't a cardiovascular outcome trial. It really focused on kidney outcomes. But of course, in this high-risk population, a lot of people had uh, prior uh, cardiovascular disease. So about 19% of the population had heart failure at baseline. Of those, uh, almost 48% had HEFPEF, 18% uh, had HEFREF, and the other Others were undefined or unknown uh, because this was reported by the uh, investigators. Uh, among the uh, patients with heart failure, most were class one uh, or class two. Very small proportion were class three, and we excluded people with uh, class four. Now, what was remarkable to me is the high rates of events of heart failure. We looked at a composite of heart failure events. So this was hospitalization for heart failure or urgent uh, treatment for heart failure plus CV death. And in the placebo uh, patients, uh, this uh, event rate was almost uh, over 5% a year. Uh, what we found was that semaglutide decreased this by 27%. Now, this was also the case in patients uh, who had 
prior heart failure. So looking at the people who had prior heart failure versus those that uh, didn't have prior heart failure, the group with prior heart failure had very high event rates. Uh, they had about 7% per year uh, composite heart failure event rates uh, compared to uh, the um, patients with no heart failure who had about 4% heart rate, uh, uh, heart failure event rate. But what was remarkable is that both in the patients uh, with a prior history of heart failure and those without a prior history of heart failure, the reduction in heart failure events uh, and CV death was comparable. It was about uh, 27%, uh, 28% in both groups. So even though the event rate was lower in those who didn't have a prior event rate, there was a substantial reduction that was uh, significant. You know, and I, that's a great summary, Rich. And I, uh, you know, one of the things that I took away from this as a cardiologist and as somebody who does a lot of cardiometabolic disease prevention is that um, this agent looks like it not only can potentially treat heart failure, but prevent it, right? And we saw that in um, with SGLT2 inhibitors as well, that this, you know, in this very high risk population, you don't just want to treat heart failure, you'd like to prevent it. And this agent could potentially do both of those things. And I think that's what this, one of the things that secondary analysis showed that the benefit of semaglutide was there, regardless of whether you already had heart failure or you didn't, it helped to prevent future heart failure events. That's exactly right. And we looked at a variety of other uh, clinically relevant uh, subgroups, uh, including things like BMI, EGFR, albumin creatinine ratio, use of loop diuretics or MRAs, and even SGLT2 inhibitors. And it turns out there was remarkable consistency of uh, benefit across all of these uh, subgroup uh, analyses. So that actually gives us more confidence uh, in the uh, results of these uh, subgroup analyses. Yeah. And one of the most um, interesting things I thought uh, from the paper was um, the analyses looking at the impact or the effect of semaglutide by baseline injection fraction or by type of heart failure at baseline, whether that was HEF-PEF or HEF-REF. And that's because we know from prior trials, um, you know, smaller studies, the FIGHT trial, the LIVE trial, um, some sub-analyses from the EXCEL trial, there was the signal of potential harm with GLP-1 receptor agonists. Um, and uh, those those studies weren't with semaglutide, they were with liraglutide and exenatide, but there was this signal for harm with GLP-1 receptor agonists with those with um, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and that's kind of given people some pause, and there hasn't been a lot of data out since then. Um, and in your analysis, you do have some, not a lot, of patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction that you that we know of, um, but there didn't seem to be any signal for harm, and indeed the benefit seemed to be consistent regardless of baseline ejection fraction. Is that what? It, would you agree with that? That's exactly right. Uh, so uh, again, one of the limitations of the flow trial is that uh, we didn't have um, the. Uh, classification of heart failure type on all of the patients with heart failure. And we didn't collect uh, echoes prospectively or uh, information about ejection fractions. We did have ejection fractions when uh, that was available. What I thought was interesting, though, uh, to your point, is though that with uh, HEF-PEF or HEF-REF, the reductions uh, in risk with semaglutide were almost identical, 0.86 and 0.88 respectively. Uh, and there was no uh, significant interaction uh, with those subgroup analyses. I think that's a really important uh, outcome because of course there were even though it was not, there were not a lot of patients with uh, HEF-REF, it's still about 18% of the people with uh, heart failure. So uh, I think this adds to the totality of data that we understand. There also didn't seem to be uh, any significant interactions by prior history of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or by New York Heart Association class. So I think that also helps to support uh, the benefits uh, across this broad spectrum of people with and at risk for heart failure. Right. Yeah. And, and that's what I took away is this this doesn't give us definitive evidence that GLP-1 receptor agonists are are effective in um, individuals with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. But it is somewhat reassuring that at least we didn't see significant harm. And I think what this really points to is that we need prospective randomized clinical trials with GLP-1 receptor agonists in individuals with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. I think that's a huge gap in the evidence right now that really does need to be addressed. Well, I'd certainly agree with that, especially as a trialist. Um, but I think the other important point, though, is, you know, 
the overwhelming majority of patients with uh, diabetes, obesity, and kidney disease have HEF-PEF. So even in the absence of a clear benefit in HEF-REF, we're establishing a clear benefit in, for the majority of patients with heart failure in this uh, very high-risk population. And I think that's significant too. Well, I think that's an excellent way to close because um, that really uh, really kind of underscores the um, importance of what you've shown in this study. So thank you so much for joining us and um, we look forward to talking again. It was my pleasure, Neha, anytime.